Hello, my name is Eric Terman and my advisor is Dr. Wayne Strasser. We're from Liberty University and I will be presenting our work on revealing hotspots in a low density polyethylene reactor using computational fluid dynamics. Low density polyethylene is a common thermoplastic widely used for packaging, sheathing and cables, plastic bottles and more. LDPE is lightweight, flexible and is non-reactive at room temperature making it extremely versatile. The polymers form through free radical polymerization. The ethylene monomers continue to build a branch chain structure wherever free radical sites exist until all sites are filled. This branching of ethylene units is what gives LDPE its unique properties. The branching effects also lead to varying viscosity and density of the polymer based on the conditions the polymer is formed in. Because the properties are so dependent on the manufacturing conditions, a CFD model was developed to better understand the process of making LDPE. The free radical polymerization process requires an environment with high pressures and temperatures. Autoclave reactors are commonly used in industrial applications to perform this process. Typical environments within the reactor can see temperatures ranging from 200 to 300 degrees Celsius. The hypothetical reactor modeled in CFD for this study is separated into four zones by zone baffles. The zone baffles are attached to the central stirring shaft. As material passes through the zone, it flows in between a gap between the baffle and the reactor wall into the next zone. The baffles and other paddles on the stirring shaft help mix the material and ensure a complete conversion of monomer to polymer. Four fresh gas feeds are fed into zone 1 along with three catalyst feeds. Two other injectors feed catalysts into zones 3 and 4. To ensure that the reactor model is treated similarly to how an actual autoclave reactor would be run, thermocouple geometries were modeled throughout the reactor. These allowed us to measure temperatures within the zone similar to how a real reactor functions, and it also has an impact on the flow behavior as the geometry of the thermocouples protrudes into the flow medium. Great care was taken to develop a mesh in order to reduce numerical errors. Working with a process that is deeply reliant on heat generation means that the mesh cannot be diffusive in nature as that impacts the results of this study. Because of this, the mesh was created using around 10,000 subvolumes or blocks. This allowed us to strictly control the shape, size, and quality of the mesh, as well as to maximize the hexagonal elements within the model. Wherever hex elements proved impossible to include, polyhedral elements were used. The injector and the thermocouple geometries relied on polyhedral elements as they are less diffusive than a TET mesh. The total mesh count for the model came out at around 6 million elements. One of the challenges with the mesh was allowing the stirrer shaft to rotate within the model to replicate a hypothetical reactor. On the meshed shaft, you can see the zone baffles and various paddles used to mix the material within the reactor. I also want to note that the figures and values I am reporting are based on a base mesh. We are currently undergoing a mesh independent study on the model using an adapted mesh which is around 7 times finer and has around 40 million elements. Because the model requires over a month of continuous running on high-performance computing cores to reach quasi-steady state, the results of that study are not ready at this time to be presented. Along with refining the mesh, it is vital our model is able to run with the largest possible time step while still being time step independent. Like I mentioned, the models take over a month to reach quasi-steady state where we can finally begin to evaluate the data. The larger the time step is, the faster the model can be developed. After running three different studies, we have determined time step independence for the base mesh. The primary metric for doing so was the temperature gradient in the bottom two zones. All of the conditions within zones 1 and 2 will have an impact downstream where zones 3 and 4 are, and this is where the temperature gradient we are using for time step independence is located. Two thermocouple values are used per zone to calculate a difference in temperature readings between the top and bottom of the zone. That value then communicates the current state of the model and how different settings are affecting the models in development. Our models used three time step sizes, normal time step, half time step, and quarter time step, with the corresponding values shown. The plots show that the overall average temperature gradient in zones 3 and 4 did not change when reducing down to the quarter time step size. Because we want to run the largest possible time step size, half time step was selected for all models running on the base mesh of 6 million elements. As we refine the mesh, the time step is decreased to ensure a low current number. The free radical polymerization process is an exothermic process with self-perpetuating reactions taking place. This means that if left unchecked, the reactions will just continue to add heat into the system at an exponential rate. The decomposition of ethylene monomers specifically can lead to a large buildup of heat and pressure. The reaction rates can exceed a controllable rate and raise the pressure above what the reactors can handle, causing them to fail. This event typically occurs when hotspots within the reactor allow to propagate from lack of mixing or from defects within the reactor. One of the goals of this CFD study was to study an LDPE autoclave reactor under normal operating conditions to better understand the formation and properties of those hotspots. The resulting models allows us to propose methods for reducing hotspots in the reactor and resulted in a better understanding as to the impact of the hotspots on their environment. The conditions within the reactor, even in CFD, are extremely variable. 
The complex flow patterns, turbulence, and chemical reactions taking place cannot be maintained if left alone. That is why our model has instituted a proportional integral derivative or PID controller. The five controllers act independently within the model to effectively maintain stable temperatures throughout all four zones. The most efficient way to control the model was to alter the pre-exponential constant in the Arrhenius equation for reaction rates of the termination step of the polymerization process. Currently in our model, initiation, propagation, and termination are included from the polymerization process to model the heat generation within the reactor. By altering the constant A seen in the equation for the termination step, our model can stop polymer chains from growing, which decreases the reaction rate and energy release overall as this constant is increased. The fewer free electron sites that are available means that there are fewer reactions taking place within the reactor. This method proved faster than adjusting the mass flow rates at the injector ports as the impact is immediately felt by the zone the controller is acting in. Each controller relies on a 60-point moving average temperature that is fed to it by a corresponding thermocouple. Along with a given set point for what the thermocouple should be reading in that zone, the controller calculates an error. The algorithm then calculates a new termination constant to reduce the latest calculated error. The plot included shows the controller successfully responding to an upset event within the CFD model as the controller errors fluctuate until eventually settling out. This process has proved effective in controlling the models requiring minimal tuning of the PID constants. I will also note that this method is physically realistic as existing literature is not able to predict the values of these termination constants and they are variable based on the environmental conditions. The control technique proved effective, yet when plotting a normalized controller output we noticed a much larger fluctuation was being seen at TC10 compared to the other controllers. We decided to create an animation of the temperature reading across the thermocouple tip so that we could understand the reasoning behind this. The animation shown depicts a 25 degree C gradient across the thermocouple. This is due to the vortex shedding events taking a place at the zone 2-3 separating baffle which is just slightly upstream of TC10. Even with the larger temperature gradient which exceeded that seen in other thermocouples, TC10 showed that it was successful in controlling the zone and that the 60 point moving average temperature was able to report a reliable value for the controller to base input actions upon. Along with reaction rates, the internal flow patterns play a big role in the temperature distributions within the model. Theorized flow patterns for reactors using similar geometries to the one in this study show the existence of a flow phenomenon called a gear point. A gear point occurs in the model where two flows meet and invert the direction of each other. The idea is that the flows meeting behave similar to one gear which rotates an adjacent gear in an opposite angular direction. When dealing with turbulent flows such as this model which has an average rotational Reynolds number of 25,000, we were unsure as to whether or not this behavior would be seen within the model. The axial velocity animation shown, however, demonstrates the existence of gear points within the CFD model in zone 1. These locations fluctuate up and down but stay relatively in the same location. The blue downward stream meets a red upward stream and they invert each other at two locations within this zone. The validation of theorized flow patterns has helped in affirming that the current state of the model is approaching realistic results due to the current amount of complexity included. Confirming current methods is helpful in moving forward and adding complexity and hopefully accuracy to the model. Now I mentioned earlier that the thermocouples had to be included within the geometry as they do provide an impact on the interior flows. The animation shown depicts the slight impact protruding geometries such as thermocouples and injectors can have on the flow. However, we found that around the smooth walls of the reactor, material was not mixing and hot spots could potentially form. To combat the lack of mixing, we proposed to install wall baffles around the reactor to solve this problem. The simple fix was to install blocks such as the ones shown in the graphic to generate shear around the walls of the reactor. As the flow around the walls encounters the baffle, it will begin to mix and reduce the temperatures within the surrounding regions. As you can see, when the wall baffles are included in the cross section, there is a profound impact on the surrounding material. Colder streams are spread by the wake of the baffle, allowing hotter regions to come into contact with colder currents. There is also the expected increase in turbulent kinetic energy in the wake which shows the increase in mixing provided by the wall baffles. Wall baffles were then installed in several locations within the reactor geometry to lower the overall temperatures in several zones. Specific studies of zones 2 and 3 revealed that wall baffles were able to lower the average volumetric temperature due to the increased mixing. CFD proved valuable in studying the impact of the injectors have on the surrounding flow. The plume coming out of the injector was tracked for all catalysts with a mass fraction above 7 e to the negative 7. This animation shows the temperature gradient across the plume with the highest gradients existing around the nozzle. This helps us understand the cooling, reactivity, and overall penetrating behavior of the catalyst plumes within the reactor. Zone 4 within the reactor is typically the hottest as the material in this zone has had the longest residence time within the reactor. 
The CFD model included a user-defined function to track any contiguous clump of material that was at a temperature greater than 300 degrees Celsius. Along with highlighting these volumes, the UDF also tracked statistics on the clump so that we can get a better understanding as to their impact on the reactor. Understanding their velocity, length scales, polymerization rate, and average location within the reactor yields useful information in how to prevent them. As the animation shows, the majority of the hotspots are concentrated around the zone 3-4 separating baffle. This is actually preferred location as there is a stream of colder material flowing in from zone 3 to cool off the clumps. In studying the largest two volumes, we found that statistically they are very similar. The largest clump contains most of the volume of all of the hotspots. Studying the hotspots has allowed us to define threshold sizes and describe material that could lead to the reactor overheating under normal operating conditions. While this study is ongoing, the initial findings are encouraging, and we hope to increase the accuracy and rigor of future models to build on the progress we have made so far. Dr. Strasser and I would like to thank Westlake Chemical for the support offered for this project. In particular, we appreciate the assistance and expertise provided by Westlake's Jimmy Salmon, Stephen Coe, and Dr. Victor Lin. Please feel free to reach out with any questions you have on our study, and thank you for your time.